We'll give it a second just in case. Hey everybody, Hi. we'll get started in about five minutes here. Just gonna wait for some people to join in, all right?
Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Thanks so much for joining us. We know it's been a little while since you've seen us. Sorry, we've just been crazy busy lately. Uh, I started a new job, finals, all the same stuff that you guys are dealing with, CASPA opening up. Um, but we're going to try and be a little bit more consistent with our sessions, at least once every two weeks. We already have the next one planned, so just stay tuned as always. We usually um, post that stuff first to Instagram, so if you guys follow us on there, you'll see it. Um, aside from that, guys, just the same usual stuff, so please be as active as you can in the comments. We'd love to see you guys talk. Uh, we'll record all of your questions and uh, re refer them back to Brina at the end during the Q&A. Um, so yeah, if you're curious about anything, anything relates to you, whatever kind of question, just please feel free to, you know, speak up. Somebody else might be thinking the same thing. Um, aside from that, I think uh, a lot of people have questions about the quiz. Ollie will talk to you about that. So it's the same format. You have five multiple choice questions and we'll send the link in the chat. Um, and it's open for one hour. As long as you answer at least four out of five correctly, you'll receive a certificate. We'll email that to you. And we do have the automatic certificates turned on so we'll talk more about that later at the end all right i think that's everybody everything uh thanks so much everybody it's great to see you all again um brina if you're ready it's all you all right hello everyone my name is brina um i am so happy to be here um i really love helping pre-PA students, um, PA school students, um, literally anyone has questions about anything, I'm happy to answer them, I'm happy to help. Um, I was once in your situation, I didn't have a ton of resources when I was where you are, nothing like there is now, even though it wasn't that long ago. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions about absolutely anything. Um, so feel free to reach out with me, reach out to me um, but without further ado, let's get started. So I will share my screen. Um, I'm also drinking wine. So if anyone else wants to drink wine with me, feel free. Um, sure. Okay. Can, can I get a yes? You can see my screen. Yes, yes. ma'am. Looks great. Okay. okay, cool. Love it. Okay. So as you guys probably know, my name is Brina. I am an acute care general and trauma surgery PA. Um, I work all at the same hospital and we'll get into a little bit about how I kind of participate in all of those um, specialties as I go on. Um, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram or email. Um, Yes, any questions you guys have, honestly, like I, people call me all the time and I talk to them on my way home from work and just chat about stuff because trust me, I know, I know what you're feeling. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about briefly, just like my path to PA school, everyone's path is a little different. So please don't compare myself to what you guys have done. Like everybody is different. Um, I did my bachelor's in science in kinesiology, and I minored in Spanish. I went to Western Washington University for my undergrad. I was a D2 soccer player, so um, I actually didn't really get started down really like the pre-med path until like I knew I wanted to do something in medicine, but I didn't work in undergrad because I had no time playing soccer. Um, I didn't like get a CNA or an EMT or anything. So all of my like healthcare hours and all of that started basically once I graduated. Um, I did do uh, between one summer I did, I went to Costa Rica for three months and worked kind of, it wasn't, it was like sort of a medical mission, but not really because I just found a place by myself and just asked like, hey, I'm an undergrad student. I don't have any experience and basically anything, but can I get some hours in healthcare here? And it was like one of the most like best things I've ever done in my whole life. Um, and so I got some like healthcare hours there. So after I graduated from undergrad, I immediately went into a year as a physical therapy aide. Uh, at the time I was kind of deciding whether I wanted to be a physical therapist or if I wanted to be a doctor or if I wanted to be a PA. And um, I just wasn't really sure what route I wanted to go. So I was kind of just dabbling a little bit in the physical therapy route. Um, my undergrad was in kinesiology. So that was like very, 
that made a sense to me. It was very easy for me. It was a lot of fun. I had a blast. Uh, but after about a year of that, I decided that I really wanted a little bit more like autonomy and just being able to do a little bit more medicine and diagnostics than they do in physical therapy. And so then I transitioned to a scribe for a family medicine uh, physician assistant. He was great. I absolutely love him. Like we still talk to this day. He's an absolutely amazing provider. And he's actually one of the, probably the biggest reasons that I decided to go to PA school. Uh, his patients loved him. He was super smart. The doctors would come ask him questions. He had been there for like 25 years. He still works there. And then after about three months of working as just like a scribe, they asked me to be a chief scribe, which just means you manage a lot of the other scribes. You fill in to other specialties. So I did some internal medicine, some OBGYN, sports medicine. Um, I think that's it. Uh, so I got a lot of different experience scribing there. I worked with doctors, PAs, NPs. Um, that was really awesome experience for me. And then during this time, because I had a graduate, an undergraduate in kinesiology, and those were kinesiology classes and not technically biology classes. A lot of the schools didn't count my like anatomy classes. And so I had to go back to community college while I was doing all this and take some anat or biology classes that would count. Um, so I took anatomy probably like so many times in my, in my life. And then I was volunteering. So I did some other volunteering for what's called the Brian Grant Foundation. Um, and then some coaching for soccer. And so just a bunch of other stuff, just trying to build up my resume and get myself. So that was about a total of two years. So I graduated in 2014 from undergrad and then got an interview end of 2016 for PA school. So I went to University of Washington, the Seattle campus. There is the MedEx program, which is where I went, has five campuses now, Hawaii, Spokane, Anchorage, Alaska, Tacoma, Hawaii, Seattle, so six now. And I think they're actually doing a Nevada campus soon. So they're a huge program. Um, I think the biggest in the country. They're the second oldest program after Duke. And uh, I was accepted into the Seattle class. I was class of 2019. We had 52 students enrolled, 50 graduated. So two dropped out, one dropped out for uh, like grades reason and one was for like a family reason. The average range was 25 to 55. Honestly, our class had a lot of people in kind of the older range. Uh, medics is kind of known for the non-traditional student. We had a lot of military background. We had a lot of like second um, career background. I was one of, or if not the youngest student in the class at the time. So it was a huge variety of people with all sorts of different backgrounds. We had someone who was an occupational therapist in her past life. We had EMTs. We had um, like Green Berets. We had past scribes, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, so for us in our class, and it's a lot, I mean, it might be different now with COVID, so I'm not really sure how everything, I guess, worked now, but so mandatory class from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. So our, because it is a campus that has multiple different campuses, they had to create like an equal playing field essentially. And so all of our material or lecture material was technically not on the exam unless it was broadcasted to every site. It was everything had to be out of the book, but we were still, it was still mandatory to go to lecture. So we had lectures from, you know, different people in the community that were experts on whatever we were talking about. And then additionally, we had to study for that. So mandatory class, we were there all day, all the time. Um, I ended up moving up to Seattle with a friend of mine. I'm from Vancouver, Washington. So it was about a three hour difference. Uh, my boyfriend at the time, now husband, he stayed in Vancouver. He loved his job. This was kind of where I was gonna come after. So he stayed and we did distance for two years. Um, 
And at my clinical year, you kind of travel ever. Every school is different, but MedX was very uh, straightforward with the fact that you will definitely travel. So I was all over the place. Like I was in, I got lucky. I got to go to Hawaii. So, um, I was in Hawaii for five months. I was in Missoula, Montana, Spokane, Washington, Seattle, um, Portland. Um, yeah, all over the place. So, and I was happy with traveling. I kind of told them like, these are what I want. I knew I wanted to go into trauma and I was like, I want a trauma rotation. Like get me the best trauma, tra- trauma rotation you can. I don't care where you send me. So at this point, my boyfriend and I were already doing distance. And so we were like, whatever. I wanted it to be a good experience for me. And, but everyone's different. We had people in our class that had kids. We had, um, people who were, you know, like grandparents. So it just, everyone's in a different walk of life. So it's important to just kind of figure out what works for you and, you know, stick to it. Like PA school's tough and it's going to be a long road. So you just have to kind of decide what you're going to do and just stick it out and know that there's an end in sight. Um, So I took the pants, which is the certification exam for PAs two weeks after I graduated. I hunkered down with my study buddies. They actually came down to Vancouver and we like basically locked ourselves up like we were working. So eight to five every day, we studied for 10 days. I took a couple of days to myself and then we took the exam. Um, I took it the Monday of the week that I got married, which was insane, but I was happy I did it, got it over with. And then I got married that week and I went on our honeymoon and it was lovely. So some stuff about me. Uh, I love to hike. I am one of those people that likes to like dangle off the edge of something high. And so this picture was taken in the top of South Sister Mountain, um, so sister summit after didactic year. So I just put this picture in here because I wanted to show you guys that you don't give up everything in your life. When you go to PA school, like you have to give up a lot, but there are times and moments where you have a break and you can kind of refresh and whatever way you do that. Um, this is something I love. We did a sunrise hike. So we backpacked up, or I just hiked up there in the middle of the night and then got up there for sunrise. And it was absolutely amazing. Um, this is what kept me sane. So this was in between didactic and clinical year. Um, other things I love doing when we're not in COVID is traveling. I've been to 18 countries. I think I love hiking. I love cycling. Um, last summer I did a bike packing trip where we bike packed from Mount Rainier to Mount hood. Um, I, I'm an avid crossfitter, hybrid crossfitter, I say. I love skiing. And again, like I mentioned earlier, I really love helping pre-PA and PA students kind of just get help and not feel pressured when they ask questions. Like, I know you probably have a million questions. Don't feel like there's anything you can't ask me because um, I don't want you to feel like there was something that you wanted to ask and you felt like you couldn't ask it. So anything you guys want, I'm happy to answer. So a little bit about my schedule and where I work. So like I said, I am an acute care general and trauma surgery PA. So the way it works is I only scrub in and help with the general surgery cases. So what that means is I I'll just start with my schedule and then we'll go to it after. How about that? So I get to work at 7 a.m. every morning. I print out my list. So I'm a hospital-based employee. So I print out my list that who is on the acute care slash trauma surgery. I print out the list. I look at it. I kind of background check everyone. And then I head to the floor and I start rounding on patients. Um, Before I got to PA school and even PA school, people kept talking about rounding. Like that was something I was supposed to know what it was. And I had never worked in the hospital before. And so I was like, what the heck is rounding? Like, I literally have no idea what that means. So rounding just means you go around to all of the patients that are on your service and you see them, you do a physical exam, um, you talk to them, you see how they're doing and you kind of decide the plan for the day. So that happens in the morning and takes however long, depending on how many um, patients you have. 
Um, another thing about my schedule is I work 410. So I work Monday through Thursday. The other PA works Tuesday through Friday. Uh, sometimes we switch so that we can have four day weekends if we need it. Um, but I have a pretty cush schedule. I don't take call. I don't work weekends right now. That might change. And like I mentioned, I work with one other PA. Um, and as you see, those are our schedules. So this is kind of my schedule for the day. So I wake up around 4.30, um, going to the gym and getting exercise has always been something that's super important to me. Even in PA school, I found time to exercise. So I exercise before work from five to six. Um, I have about a 40 minute commute. So I hop in the shower. My husband makes me breakfast. I leave the house with wet hair and in my scrubs and I go straight to work. Like I said, get there on seven. We start rounding. We go see all the patients. Um, generally, I would say in the past, I've seen it where people round as a group. So the surgeon or whatever attending you have and the PAs or the NPs and the nurses kind of round together. We don't do it that way. We in acute care surgery and trauma, like you don't know when things are going to come in. So it's very volatile. So you need to kind of get your rounding done in the morning so that you can kind of take on whatever's going to happen during the day. Cause if you have to see 12 patients, you've only seen three of them, you get three consults at 10 AM, like you're so behind already. And, you know, these piece, these patients need to be seen in the morning so that you, you know, create a plan for them. So we try to round. So we kind of split the list, uh, the surgeon and I, um, he'll start from, say, the ICU. I start from the eighth floor and we kind of work and meet in the middle. If there's another PA, then, you know, we're all kind of seeing all the patients, tag teammate, get everyone seen. Obviously, if we have any questions, concerns, if there's something we're like, hey, we don't know what we're doing with this patient, we can talk to the surgeon. But we have a lot of autonomy in the sense of we can make decisions, we order labs, we give medications, we make plans and assessments on patients. We go see consults and admit patients. So there's a ton of stuff that we do that doesn't require the surgeon's permission, I guess. Like they obviously know what's going on, but we make a lot of our own decisions that don't require supervision, I would say. Um, and then, so that's kind of the acute care surgery and acute care surgery and trauma service is kind of lumped into one. In addition to that, we have a couple general surgeons who need PA assists in their cases. And so throughout the day, depending on the day in which surgeon is on, I'll get paid. So they'll say, you know, come down to OR6. There's a lap coli that doctor, whoever needs help with. So I come down, all I do is scrub in, help with the surgery, and then I leave. Um, then I go back to checking on patients on the floor, if there's any consults that need to be done, um, if there's an acute care surgery that needs help, if there's a trauma, whatnot. Um, acute care cases, like I mentioned, they can come in in the middle of the night. I don't work nights, but they can come in at any time in the night, day, whenever. So whenever they come in and we need to do surgery, that's when they put on the OR schedule. And same with traumas. So our hospital has what's called modified traumas and full traumas. So a modified trauma is run entirely by the emergency department. And that basically just means we don't need a surgeon or a surgical staff member or service there. So it's something that the EMS crew doesn't think is a huge deal. Like it's a trauma obviously, but it isn't a huge trauma where there's any surgical intervention needing to happen. There's no chest tubes that need to be placed. There's no central lines. There's no bleeding out. You know, there's nothing crazy happening. And, you know, as a trauma service, you get a lot of those. There's not always just like the gunshot wound to the chest bleeding out scenario. Like that is fairly rare compared to how many modified kind of traumas you get. And then um, we have full trauma. So the full traumas are, that's like the whole, whole, whole hospital activation. Like you get the OR staff there, you get the surgery service there, you get the, you know, everybody is in, you know, waiting for this patient. This is a very critically ill patient that needs um, very acute emergent surgical or some more other intervention. Um, so then our team will come and 
we obviously do the trauma survey and see what needs to be done and make decisions and if they need to be transferred, if they stay, whatnot. And then my day ends around 5 p.m. The surgeons do sign off and shift change at seven. So they do 12 hour shifts. We do uh, the PAs do 10 hour shifts. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. It's just the way that our schedules were made uh, when I started. And I'm fairly new. So I started, this is my first job and I started August of 2020. So I've been there however many months that is, eight months maybe. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about some cases. Um, this is probably why you guys are here. You don't care about all the other gibberish I'm telling you. Time for wine. Okay, so this is very like reminiscent of my day. And honestly, like I had this page probably, I don't even know, like eight times this week. So you receive this page. And yes, we do use pagers, like real pagers. You receive this page at 11.30 a.m. Console, ED, room three, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting from Dr. Still, because you know there's a trillion ED doctors. So in this scenario, say it was today. Today it was just myself and the surgeon. So we both received this page. Um, sometimes I'm in the OR. So today I was actually mostly in the OR. So this consult comes in, my pager's on the table. I'm just like, okay, the, the surgeon has it. If I'm not doing anything or I'm out of the OR, then I go see this consult. Okay, so Miss Crank is a 75-year-old female with a past middle hi medical history of colon cancer, and she has a colostomy and COPD. So colostomy, she has like an ostomy bag that she um, has bowel movements into. She presents to the emergency room with three-day history of nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. She has ha had a bowel movement and has had loss of appetite for the last two days. So some very important things to ask when you are a surgical PA, um, or if you're an ED PA or uh, a hospitalist PA and you're consulting surgery, especially like general surgery or something where they have abdominal symptoms. Like we need to know if they've had prior abdominal surgeries because that, um, that makes a huge difference in a lot of times the surgeon planning, the surgeon approach, whether it's something that they can do in that facility, whether it's something that needs to be transferred. You know, there's like a lot of reasons that it's really important. Um, any allergies, any meds that they take, she doesn't take anything and basic social history, something that I is really important to discharge planning in the hospital is just who do you live with? Where do you live? Um, my population around my hospital is we have a ton of homeless. Um, we have a ton of people that don't have good access to care. So we need to know where we're dis discharging them to. Do we have a safe discharge plan? Um, so no drug use and she's a social drinker. Okay. So this is kind of what you see. So when I go see a patient, generally I, before, even though I get that page, I pull up a computer and I'll say, okay, what, who is this patient? Why is, why are they here? What are their labs? What are their vitals? What other imaging have they done? Just so that I have an idea of what I'm walking into. I don't want to go in there blind because you don't want to know nothing about your patient. You want to be able to actually, you know, sound intelligent um, and have some background because that's going to dictate what kind of questions you ask. That's going to dictate um, kind of where your brain is thinking on an assessment and plan going into it. Um, I will admit a lot of times before we go see patients, like we already have the CT scans and we basically kind of know what's going on by then, but it's good to kind of have an idea before you walk into it, know their name, kind of know some stuff about them because people are more willing to open up to you. If they if you sound like you've done your work and you're educated on them as a patient. So her temperature is normal. Um, her blood pressure is fine. Uh, her respiratory rate's fine and her O2 sats are fine. She has a mildly elevated white blood count and a mildly elevated lactate. So her lactate, normal lactate is 2.2. Lactate just often is a, uh, a measurement of ischemia or cell death. Um, so often with uh, bowel type injuries, we're often checking a lactate. 
but her labs are fairly benign. I mean, it's a little bit elevated, but nothing that you're like super scared about. So you go examine the patient and this is what you find. So she's not in any acute distress. She's kind of sitting there like this, hanging out, you know, chatting up a storm. But at this point, she came into the emergency room. She's probably gotten some Dilaudid. She's gotten some pain medication. So you have to take that into account when you're examining the patient too. Um, her heart rate's regular rate and rhythm. Her pulmonary exam is her lungs are cleared auscultation bilaterally. And her abdomen is softly descended with mid epigastric tenderness. So kind of mid abdomen. Um, she has a left lower quadrant ostomy and there's no stool in the appliance. She has absent bowel sounds. Um, you're pushing on her belly and she has no peritoneal findings. So basically that means if you push on her belly, she's not like jumping up because um, when you barely touch her, she has peritoneal signs basically means that there's kind of like an infection or irritation of the peritoneal lining of the abdomen, uh, which kind of means that the infection is spread throughout the abdomen. So she doesn't have that, but she has no bowel sounds and no stool in her appliance. She's laying in her emergency room bed and her skin is anicteric, which just means that she doesn't have like yellowing jaundice of her skin. So at this point, what imaging study would you hope the ED doc has ordered? And if not, what will you ask he or she to order to confirm your suspicion? So like I said, most of the time when I go to the emergency room, there's either a CT scan pending or it's already read by the radiologist. Um, surgeons pretty much don't do anything without a CT scan, I would say. I mean, that's a gross overestimation, but like the amount of CT scans that we use to determine um, pathological findings is a lot because there, this could be so many things. Um, and so for this patient, um, when I looked at her chart, her CT scan was pending. So what we're hoping that was ordered was a CT scan. Um, we are concerned that she doesn't have, she's had prior surgery, which was her colostomy for her colon cancer. So she had a colon resection. So someone's been in her abdomen before that's important for surgery because surgical adhesions can form, which are basically just, um, kind of like little pieces of tissue that attach to your bowel that can get attached to different things. So your bowel gets kind of stuck up and turned around and twisted and can get basically kinked. Um, so we hope that a CT scan of the abdomen was ordered. So when we look at the CT, so we look at the CT, it wasn't read by radiology less yet. Um, so you're looking at it yourself. I look at every CT scan, even though I'm not a radiologist and I had very minimal radiological training in PA school, it's, I'm hoping to get better. So I look at all the images and I, and if I don't know what I'm looking at, then I just ask the surgeon, Hey, can you show me where this is, or I try to look at it and then see what the radiologist read it as, and then go back and be like, okay, where did he, um, he or she find this, this, you know, abnormality. So I look at the, look at the, um, CT scan. And I see that there's air or there's fluid levels, which kind of means that there's bowel and there's kind of this line right here. And I was trying to get a picture, but I didn't have time to put a picture in here, but um, there's like a little line like this. And basically that's just meaning that there's kind of fluid in there or some sort of, um, area, which is this mid abdomen or transition point. So there's a transition point, which basically means her bowels go from this to really tiny. So there's something blocking it from here to here. If it goes big, 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 big. And then all of a sudden little, little, nothing's getting through here. Like this side's not working. So that's a transition point. So we see that on the CT scan, I go and see the patient. Um, the CT scan's not read yet, but I have a very high suspicion because she's got nothing in her ostomy and she um, has been throwing up. She's got all the classic signs of a small bowel obstruction. So I go see the patient, talk to her, get her history, do the physical exam. And 
after you see the patient, you come back, you see the imaging and you, you look at what the radiologist says and it says, okay, she's got a small bowel obstruction. So I think a misnomer, the reason I put this case in here is because in PA school, we learned that a small bowel obstruction basically means you're going to the OR. Like it's a scary situation, which it is absolutely. But I would say 80% of the small bowel obstructions that I see do not go to the emergency room or go to the OR for surgery. They are treated non-operatively. And like I wrote here, 50 to 80% of small bowel obstructions resolve with non-operative treatment. So I know that I work on a surgery service, but I manage a ton of small bowel obstructions and not every single one of them gets surgery. So the first thing that we do for this patient, because she's not super, super sick, um, we pay, we make her NPO so she can't eat. We place an NG tube. So we place a tube down her nose into her stomach and excuse me, we you, uh, attach it to the wall section. So low intermittent wall section. Basically what that does is it sucks and then releases, suck, release, suck, release, suck, release. Um, and that sucks out all the contents from her stomach to kind of basically suck out that area that was obstructed and allow the bowel to move whatever else is through. Um, we admit this patient to our service instead of the medical service, because she doesn't have a lot of past medical history. All she has is COPD. So this is something very much we can manage. If this person had diabetes, hypertension, history of a, a stroke, all of that stuff, then we would admit them to medicine and then consult of them. So, like I said, the initial management of a small bowel obstruction without signs of ex ischemia or peritonitis is conservative. So I had mentioned that lactate at the very beginning was 2.3, which just means um, it's a sign of ischemia. So her lactate was just mildly elevated. So once we give fluids and we try conservative management, if that improves, then that's great. If in the other, you know, other way, if we give fluids, we put an NG tube in, we don't let her eat. And then she is not getting better. Her stomach, her stomach still hurts. She's still distended her lactate is going up, then that's a patient we would take to the OR and do a, you know, a small bowel excision on, we would do an X slap, we would open them up kind of, and just go in there and see what's going on um, and take that and take out a piece of the bowel if, if needed. Um, and so this, the reason that this patient is on our service is because they need to be monitored by someone from the surgery service to make sure that they don't need, sur they don't need surgery. So if we, if we see her every day and she's getting worse then we know, and we are there to take her to surgery. If we don't see her every day and someone else is seeing her who doesn't know if she's going to need surgery right away, then she could go two, three days without, you know, without it being noticed that she needs immediate surgical intervention. So I know this isn't technically a surgical patient, but I just thought it would be a good uh, patient to kind of show you that there's a broad spectrum of kind of stuff that we do on the surgery service. All right, case two. So this um, is a trauma case. So you get this page and you hear an announcement overhead at 9 a.m. Full trauma, ED room one, ETA 10 minutes. So any full trauma will be announced overhead at our hospital. Um, you won't always have an ETA. Sometimes it's like here now. So I'm like sprinting across the hospital getting to the um, trauma bed. Okay. So basically stop whatever you're doing, unless you're in the OR helping another surgeon, you don't scrub out unless someone comes get to you and needs you and you head straight to the emergency room. So if you're in a clinic patient, if you're in the hospital, like you stop what you're doing, you go to the trauma bay, you gown up, glove up, mask up. So no matter what the trauma is, you may not know until you are like the patient is here. So always put a gown on, um, it's waterproof, prevents blood splatter, prevents, um, protects yourself, prevents everyone else, uh, glove up obviously and mask up. So N95s now, because you don't know if this patient is COVID positive or not. Um, so always N95s. You get in the room, you get prepared for the patient arrival. So sometimes the patient's there when you get to the room and you run in, you kind of figure out what's going on. Other times you beat the patient to the room, you get ready to transfer them from the stretcher or you start trying to listen 
from the charge nurse or the trauma charge nurse of what the story was. Sometimes they get a little bit of heads up, sometimes they don't. Okay, so the patient arrives on a stretcher by EMS and they're wheeling the patient in the room and EMS gives you the report. A 55 year old male who fell off a ladder about 15 feet landed on his left side. Initial loss of consciousness without known duration. He has a C collar in place, a GCS of 15 upon EMS arrival. A blood pressure and vitals are stable en route, and he has two large bore anticubital fossa IVs. So let me break that down a little bit. So he fell from quite a bit, quite a high fall. Um, initial loss of consciousness. So nobody witnessed the event. So no one knows how long he was, he had loss of consciousness. A C collar, um, if you don't know, is basically a C spine immobilizer. It's a soft immobilizer that uh, EMS puts on every trauma patient to prevent C spine mobilization to prevent spinal cord injuries. And the GCS is a uh, basically a way to identify uh, the neurological status of a patient. 15 is the, the best that you can be. So he's full, he's fully neurologically awake, alert, all oriented, can move all his extremities, opens his eyes, follows commands, all of that stuff. So you're not worried that he's like uh, kind of crumping on you or losing an airway or anything like that. And then almost every trauma patient, if not every trauma patient should have two large antecubital fossas IVs. So right here, they should have two large bore, so 18 gauge or larger IVs so that um, we can administer fluid and blood products and whatever else we need. So the first, first, first thing you will need to do to this patient. Um, so the first thing that we want to assess in this patient is um, is their airway, like is the ABCs of trauma, airway, breathing, and circulation. So the very first thing you're going to do to this patient is literally talk to them, is literally just come up to them, say, hey, what's your name? Um, can you, you know, point to your forehead? Are you understanding me? Do you, you know, just kind of basically talk, like talk to them and see if they'll talk to you. If they can respond, their airway is intact. So that basically checks off Number one, breathing, listen to their breath sounds and then C circulation. So you find a pulse. So right there, just go for a radial pulse. If you can feel a pulse, a good like little tidbit is their systolic blood pressure is greater than 90. So if you can feel a peripheral pulse, then you know they have a little bit of a blood pressure. Um, so that's kind of the first things you're going to do. This can all be done within literally 10 seconds, 10 to 15 seconds. This can be, ha this can all be done while the patient is literally getting transferred to the bed from the stretcher. You're talking to them, you take your stethoscope, you listen to their, to their lungs. Do they have equal breath sounds? Do they have bilateral breath sounds? Um, are they muffled? Um, yeah, basically you're just kind of checking to see is he, is, is he have a chest rise? Like, can, are they breathing? And then circulation quick, like, can I feel their pulse? All right, we're good. So that's kind of like the first initial thing. If you initially, if someone can't talk, like if they initially aren't able to protect their own airway, then, you know, you don't even move on to B, B, C, D, E. You literally stay at A and you're like, okay, this person doesn't have an airway. Like they aren't able to breathe for themselves or and there's nothing that they're going to be able to breathe out of. So what do I need to do? Do I need to intubate the patient? Do I need to do a surgical airway? Do I need to do um, like an oropharynx and nasopharynx? Like, do I need to do like any kind of nasal airway or oral airway? Like, what do I need to do to get this person have basically some sort of cylindrical hole that they can breathe out of? Um, and then once that's accomplished, then you move on to the next. Okay. So D and E. So disability, that's like I said, the GCS, usually the EMS will come in, they'll say GCS 13, 15, whatever the GCS score is, but you don't start evaluating for GCS until you evaluated ABC. So can they breathe or can, do they have an airway? Can they breathe? And is there circulation? If those three things are yes, then you can move on to D and E. So D, 
disability? What's their GCS score? So GCS score um, is three different, um, what's the word? Like three different categories make up your GCS. Your, your eyes, like can you open them? Basically, do you open to spontaneous pain? Like what eye movement do you have? What motor movement do you have? And um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking, sensation? Sensory. I'm blanking now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, so those are all measured. There's like a, a little, I should have put it in here. There's a little, um, basically a box. It's like, that tells you what each number does. And then you calculate the GCS score and then um, that will kind of give you an idea. So each different range, so less than eight is like a major problem. So GCS less than eight is you intubate. That's like a very major neurological deficit and you need, and they can't probably protect their airway. Um, and so, you need to intubate them. You need to give them an airway. Um, then there's like mild, which is kind of in between that. I think it's nine to 12 and then 12 to 15 is mild. So, or moderate and then mild. And then after you assess that and so, okay, so I said this guy's GCS score was 15. So he has no neuro neurological deficit. So he opens his eyes spontaneously. He doesn't need help. He moves his arms. Um, he doesn't, he like moves around. He doesn't need, um, he's not only moving or withdrawing to pain. Um, so all of those things are normal. So now we're moving to exposure and environment. So another thing with trauma patients is if it is a trauma case, you need to completely declode the patient. So you need to see every part of their body. You need to cut their clothes. You need to be able to fully examine because if you don't take off their clothes, you could easily miss something. So you could easily miss a injury. You can easily miss, um, bleeding from somewhere. Uh, you need to expose all of them so that you know what you're looking at. And then the other important thing is to keep patients warm. So trauma patients, the, you don't want them to become hypothermic because there's a risk for coagulopathy and you want to keep them warm at all times. So warm blankets, some people or hospitals have what's called a bear hugger, um, which is kind of like this, um, warming air thingy that goes underneath the patient and they put it on them and they basically have warm air that goes into them. Also warm fluids, um, stuff like that keeps the patient warm. All right. Okay. So this patient's vitals are stable. He is talking, knows his name, has normal breath sounds and palpable pulses. He reports that he was working on his roof, slipped and fell, landing on his left shoulder. He has left shoulder pain and vague abdominal pain. You do a quick full body assessment and notice a superficial abrasion to the left forehead with swelling and visible left shoulder deformity. He has a palpable radial pulse on the left upper extremity. Left-sided pelvic te uh, tenderness is elicited. Negative fast exam by the ED doc. So what all this means is, so the patient fell, you've done the ABCDEs at this point. So they have an airway, they're breathing, they have good circulation, their neuro exam is intact, and they now you're cutting off the clothes and you're taking a good look at them head to toe. You put some warm blankets on them. So he has an abrasion, his shoulder looks deformed, um, and he has some pain on the left pelvis. So a fast exam is basically a quick ultrasound exam that you use to identify bleeding or fluid. Uh, with a fast exam, fluid in the abdomen is blood until basically proven otherwise. So yours. Uh, you look at the heart, you look at Morrison's pouch, which is on the right, the spleen, and then um, the suprapubic region for basically any abnormal fluid. It's a really quick exam. It's not, if, it's, if you see fluid, that basically is like the patient's going to need either CT quickly if they're stable or they're going to the OR. Um, it kind of depends on the scenario and how the patient's doing hemodynamically. Um, so in this case, the FAST is negative. So that means 
they didn't see any abnormal fluid in the, in the abdomen based on the exam. That doesn't mean if you do a fast exam and it's native, doesn't mean there isn't fluid in the abdomen. It just means that you didn't see it on the fast. So if the patient is hemodynamically stable and there's a negative fast, then you're like, okay, maybe they don't have any kind of abdominal injury, intra-abdominal injury. So the other important thing to do with a trauma patient is you always want to roll the patient and look at their backside. So they're laying on a stretcher or on a backboard, you move them over. You need to take a look at their back because there's a lot of um, injuries that you can miss from the back. There's, you know, spinal um, step-offs from spine fractures or dislocations or anything that you wouldn't necessarily see unless you turn them over. So you use, someone is always monitoring the C-spine because you don't want to cause a neurological injury. So someone at the, at the head of the bed is always calling when to roll the patient, you roll the patient. And then one of the providers is doing a posterior exam on the patient. And then you decide to skip the rectal exam because the patient is awake, alert, oriented, and GCS-15 moves, moves all of the extremities and doesn't have any neuro deficits. So you order a quick C or chest X-ray of the left shoulder to be completed in the trauma bay. So there are portable X-rays that can kind of swing in and they will take a picture and you can kind of do this really quick if the patient is stable, um, which this patient was. So we roll them in quick. We take a picture of their left shoulder and of their chest. We're looking for any um, hemothorax, uh, pneumothorax, any uh, medial spinal shift, whatnot. The patient is stable, so their blood pressure is stable. They're not tanking, and we're going to send them to the CT scanner. You pan scan them, which just means a scan from head to pelvis, and they get rolled in the scanner. So we talked about the roll. So sometimes you can do it in the trauma bay if it flows with the way you're doing stuff, and you're like, I'm pretty, I don't think they have a, some injury on the back, so um, we'll just wait until we take them to the scanner if they're stable. So you take them to the scanner and you're like, okay, while we're transferring this patient, let's roll them quick and do an exam. So it really just kind of depends on the flow of stuff. And, um, yeah, just kind of depends. So the shoulder x-ray shows a displaced humeral head fracture and a chest CT and x-ray shows left fifth through seventh rib fractures. So you decide to console ortho for the humeral head fracture and then work, let them work their magic. I'm not a trauma PA or I'm not an ortho PA. So um, there's a lot of basic ortho splinting we can do. And that's, we do basically like the splinting and making sure that they're hemodynamically stable. And if they're not bleeding out from anything, then we send whatever surgical stuff to ortho. So ortho comes and sees the patient you admit them to the trauma service, which is us, the acute care surgery and trauma service. And then um, you send them up to the floor. This patient doesn't need to go to the ICU. Um, they're pretty stable. I'm not worried about them neurologically really. So I'm sending them to the floor. What needs to be done generally within 24 hours of admitting this patient? All right, so. The tertiary trauma assessment. So this is something you don't really hear a lot about with traumas. Um, I don't know why, because it's super important. But basically, you within 24 hours that the patient gets admitted to the hospital, you or if they're in the ICU and you can't really do it, then you can wait till they get to the floor. But um, you want to do basically a full body head, you know, head head to toe exam. So this is after kind of the initial shock of the trauma, the patients, you know, cal basically calm down a little bit and they're able to feel pain that maybe they had distracting pain. So this patient had left shoulder dislocation. So that's probably the most pain that they were feeling, but maybe they had a left pinky fracture, or maybe they had like a something else on the other side of their body that they didn't even feel because they were in so much pain from the shoulder. And so this is your chance to really 
go through your exam, head to toe, everything you learn in PA school and just look in their ears, their eyes, their nose, their mouth, everything. Um, listen to their lungs again, look at all their joints and make sure that there's nothing missing. So if the patient's like, I really have this like right ankle pain, you feel it, you look at it it's swollen. You're like, Hey, let me get an x-ray of that. We didn't even think of that yesterday. Cause that wasn't life threatening kind of the trauma. The trauma role is to rule out everything life threat, life threatening and, and take care of it. Like what's going to kill them right now. We need to fix that. Everything else we can manage later on. Um, so this guy, his shoulder needed to be fixed. They, we splinted it. We called ortho. They decide if they want to take it to surgery right now. Um, he had pulses intact, so it wasn't compromising, compromising his cardiovascular vascularization to his arm. Um, and then now we're doing this full body assessment. Um, a story I have about this is I had a patient not too long ago, very similar to this case. He had a fracture, an upper arm fracture, and he was, he was admitted to the hospital. He was taken to the OR on his hospital day one for his arm. He, I saw him hospital day two and I was like, okay, getting up, getting walking around. He was feeling great. I was like, how's your arm? Ortho was like, oh, he can leave. Like he's ready to discharge from our perspective. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to go take a quick look at him. And then, um, I'll probably get him out of here and I'll discharge him. I go see the patient. He's like, gosh, my ankle is really hurting me. Like I couldn't even work with PT, uh, today. And I looked at the PT notes and I was like, well, that's bizarre. Like he's here for his arm and his rib fractures. And I go and look at the patient's ankle and it's super swollen. And I'm like, Hmm. So I get an x-ray and he has a calcaneus fracture, which is a very, very bad fracture. And ortho was about to just send him out the door after doing surgery. They didn't even look at his ankle. And so it was a good thing that I ended up looking at this patient's ankle before we sent him out of the hospital discharged with a broken calcaneus fracture. That would have been horrible. So that's why we do this. The patient didn't even feel the ankle pain initially because he had so many other things going on. So it's just a time to humble yourself, take a look at the patient from head to toe and just make sure that everything's, everything's kosher. So this is kind of the resolution of this patient. So the rib fractures were treated with aggressive pulmonary toilet, which is also known as um, pulmonary hygiene, which just means an incentive spirometer and a multimodal pain control. Ortho takes the patient to the OR to fix the fracture and the patient is discharged in a couple days on oral pain medications. So multimodal pain control is just a bunch of pain medications like muscle relaxers, neurolog uh, like nerve pain medications, NSAIDs, Tylenol, and a bunch of medications kind of as a combo to help reduce the amount of narcotics we use, especially with um, like post-operative patients or trauma patients, because they are going to require a lot of pain medication. Um, we just don't want to give them a bunch of narcotics all the time, obviously. All right. So that's my cases. I just talked a lot. I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, in addition to like, basically what I do every day of my life, at work, I just wanted to kind of give you guys some resources and uh, basically just some stuff to help you get through surgery. I know not everyone here wants to do surgery, um, but I'm pretty sure everyone has to do some sort of surgery rotation. So surgery recall is an amazing, cheap little booklet that has basically everything you need to know for your surgery rotation. Um, I have one, I still use it. It has uh, basic treatment plans for very basic, like general surgery type cases. It has the instruments that you often use in the OR. It's just an awesome resource and it's totally worth it. Um, I highly recommend getting that. Know your anatomy before you go into a surgical rotation. So I didn't even actually do a general surgery rotation. I did an, a trauma rotation, but I didn't actually do much surgery. Um, it was more of just like, uh, trauma activation and running traumas. And then I did an ortho rotation. So I got a job in acute care surgery and trauma without actually even having like a general surgery rotation. But for ortho, like, no, I went into it. Like I needed to review, you know, shoulder anatomy, knee anatomy, hip anatomy, 
all that, just kind of know the basics so that you're not going into it blind and they're going to ask you questions. Um, so, so that you kind of can help yourself a little bit and you'll get more out of it if you know where you are and what you're looking at. YouTube cases you will be doing beforehand. Um, a lot of times just ask, be like, Hey, do you know what the cases are tomorrow? Um, or in acute care surgery, you can't do that, but there's a general couple of them that are often done. So you can just YouTube and be like, okay, what are the most common, uh, approaches to this kind of a surgery. Every surgeon does it a little bit different. I can tell you gallbladders are done 150,000 different ways. Um, but at least knowing what it looks like in there. So, you know, what the gallbladder looks like when you get in there would be helpful. Um, know your glove size. This is a huge one. Um, your class or your, your school should have some gloves. If not go out and look for sterile grubs and see if you can put them on and see what size you are. I think about six and a half for women, six and a half, seven is pretty average. Um, I would say always, always, always double glove. I wear an indicator glove. So a colored glove. So like a blue glove first, that's the size seven. So my bigger glove goes on first. And then I put my smaller glove six and a half over top. And that is a white glove. An indicator glove underneath basically just shows that if your first glove gets ripped somehow in surgery, you can see the blue underneath. And then, you know, okay, I need a new glove. Um, your scrub techs will be very helpful in making sure that, you know, just point out, be like, Hey, I, you know, my gloves broken. Can I get another one? They are very, don't touch their sterile file field. They're very like in charge of what's going on in the OR for like sterility wise. So make friends with them. They're super helpful. Honestly, they helped me so much when I first started my job. And then, like I said, have fun, like put yourself out there. It's going to be super awkward. The OR is very, very, very intimidating. Um, the nurses can be scary. Sometimes the scrub techs can be scary. The surgeons can be scary. Anesthesia can be scary. Um, you just have to be, uh, respectful of the people you're with. Every surgeon does it differently. Every surgeon likes their OR differently. Some surgeons like it completely silent. They don't want you to even like breathe in their OR. Uh, some surgeons like to blast music, like to talk about random stuff. Some surgeons like very small, like small talk. Like I can kind of talk to you, but I don't really have to listen kind of thing. So you just kind of feel it out. And often you can ask, like ask the nurses, like, Hey, like, you know, does this surgeon like, if I ask questions, um, you know, they'll know better than you are going to be being the brand new student. And if you're with a PA doing a rotation, like ask them, and they'll give you a good idea of kind of what, what to feel during your surgery, um, rotation, but those are all kind of helpful hints and stuff that I have for you guys. And obviously I have a lot more, but not to put on the screen. So just if you guys get to that point or you are at that point, then feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to kind of give you all the pointers about surgery because I was very intimidated going into it. Honestly, I never worked in a hospital before PA school. So all of it was brand new for me. Okay. So this is kind of the end um, where I'll let you guys ask any questions, uh, anything about PA school, um, my relationship, like how that was in PA school, finding a job, studying, travel, anything you want to ask me, I am happy, happy, happy to answer. Um, so I'm all your guys's for now. Awesome. Thanks so much. That was a fantastic presentation. We'll go ahead and jump into the questions. Um, oh, by the way, just kind of an idea, since I know you're not looking at the chat right now, but we've had about 200 viewers the whole way through. The chat's been going nuts. Everybody loves you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's kind of weird when you're just sitting at your screen and like talking to yourself the whole time. You don't know what's going on. I right know. Now. Everybody I'm like, is you. anyone listening to me? <laughs> I'm just drinking my wine. No, yeah, there's like 200 <laughs> very stressed PA students all oh, over no. you, right? No. <laughs> um, but so one person was asking, um, you mentioned that you go on a vacation often, but there's only one other PA that you work with. So how does that work? Like, are you given like uh, PTO through your job or how do you make time for vacation? So, um, the other PA I work with is pretty like, well, okay. So start out, I've only been there since August. So I already have like all my plans. I'm very like type A. I have my stuff planned in advance. So basically I just like tell my work. I was like, I'm going to be gone during these times. Um, our work is very good about being like, if you're going to be gone, then you're gone. Like there's nothing I, 
you know, basically like you're gone, you're gone. It's your time. Um, so I talked to the other PA and basically I'm like, okay, I want to be gone these days. Can you work these days? Um, so most of the time, almost always, there's at least one of us. The only time there's one week during the summer, I'll be gone and he's on paternity leave that they won't have a PA, but every other day of the year, there's at least one of us on. So we can just make it work between the two of us. We kind of just talk and he's like, okay, I want to take these days off. Um, and I take other days off. So we just kind of make it work between the two of us. Damn, that's fantastic. Seems like you have a great relationship with all the people that you work with. (laughs) Yeah, it's great. Um, so kind of, kind of jumping from that, um, as a trauma PA, I'm sure that you're familiar with like the levels of like kind of like the rating system with hospitals. So they have like level one trauma center, level two trauma center. If you could just elaborate on like, what exactly does that mean? So there are, I don't know the specific, um, like rules between each one. Um, level one is like the top tier trauma center. You have to basically have like a neurosurgeon, basically like in, I think it's in the hospital or on call 24 seven, you have to basically have every single potential person on call or available within, I think 10 minutes, 24 seven level, level two. Um, I think it's a little, I don't, I don't know all the rules, but level two is a little different. Like you, you have to have the, you can't, you don't have a neurosurgeon on all the time, or it's something about like the availability to the subspecialties. I work in a level three and we don't have neurosurgery. So any neurological cases get, um, sent to a different hospital, but we do all like stabilizing and, you know, basically any traumas that come in, we stabilize. And if we can't manage them, and if there's anything neurological, we send them, um, to a different hospital. But yeah, it's like one, two, three, four. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know all of them off the top of my head. No, you're <laughs> that just kind of gives us an idea because I know that those terms get thrown around there a lot of the time. Medical field is so crazy. There's so many abbreviations, and like so much stuff to know. So yeah. Um, let's see, Yuri was asking, what are compression stockings? Oh, okay. So compression stockings are basically like socks that have, um, different millimeters of mercury compression. So they basically compress, like you don't feel that they're not super tight, but you wear them on your lower extremities to help prevent varicose veins from standing for long periods of time. So you can get them, um, on Amazon and stuff. I just got some off Amazon and they, when you're standing in surgery for hours and hours and end all your, um, venous blood kind of pools in your legs and you can get varicose veins. And so compression stockings basically just help compress the venous system and help send the blood back up to your heart. So you don't have varicose veins long-term. I hear it's, it's comfortable too, right? Like everybody says they're a godsend to make your feet feel better. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're, they're not like tight. They just, yeah, they're great. Honestly, I need to order like 17 more. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So Jess was asking, how long did it take you to find a job after graduating PA school? Or I guess after finishing your pants? Yeah. So I, so immediately after I graduated, I took a bunch of time off. We traveled for our honeymoon. I got married and I was just like really done. You know, after you will be after school, you're going to be like, I'm done. So I took some time off. I started and that, so I graduated September. I started really looking for a job in January, COVID hit in March. So I started like job hunting in the middle of COVID. I was very, very picky about what I wanted. I wanted to be in trauma and I wanted to be in basically trauma or the hospital um, and a little bit of surgery. So I basically did not stop looking until I found a job that I wanted very particular. I could have gotten a job. I got job offers earlier on, but I was just like, I have time. I'm, I'm able to, I was in a good financial position to take some time. And so I got offered my job in May of 2020. So I started looking in January. So about five months, um, of being very picky. Okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. I know, um, that's kind of like one of those scary issues right now, because as pre-PA students, we always hear like, Oh, the job market's so saturated. It's so hard to find a job. You're going to have to relocate all this stuff. That's you know, kind of intimidating going into the field, but it's refreshing to hear that you were still able to do it, multiple job offers, right? And then found something that you loved. 
Yeah. And I mean, it really, I hear a lot of things. A lot of people say either you pick where you want to work or what you want to work in. I kind of did both. Like I was like, I knew where I, I wasn't moving. I was moving back to be with my husband at the time. So I was moving back to Vancouver and I was picky about what I wanted. So it took me a little bit longer. Some people are like, I don't care where I start off, like throw me wherever, as long as I'm in Chicago. Um, but so it really just depends on kind of what you're looking for, but you'll find like everyone will kind of find something. And if you have to work in something you don't love for a little bit, then if that's what you want to do, then do it and then move on to the back, the next thing that you want to do. That's the great thing about being a PA. Right. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Jumping off that Anna Marie was asking, uh, how did you get your job in trauma? So let me elaborate on that a little bit. I guess I feel like working as a trauma PA is kind of like a selective job where there's not a whole lot of them, but it's kind of something that a lot of people want to do. And as a new grad, it seems like you must have done something right to stand out amongst the competition. So what made you so awesome that they wanted to pick you? <laughs> um, so I like was always really interested in trauma. So I did my elective rotation in school and trauma. So I did my elective rotation in a, a level one hospital. And then my general surgery rotation was actually in like a general surgery slash trauma level two center. So I just basically made it apparent that that was essentially what I wanted to do. Um, and I just, in my interviews, I was just like, this is what I want. This is what I've held out for. Um, and I just, yeah, proved to them and basically showed them through what I had done in school that it was important that I end up in this position. Um, it is kind of a, I, I mean, I'm in a level three, so I'm not in like a hot as high of level trauma center as I probably necessarily want to be in. Um, but I learn a lot. I get to do a lot of different stuff. I do a lot of different surgical stuff as well. So I get like a broad spectrum. Um, but yeah, it's very different. I got, uh, the level one center that I did my rotation at, they basically were like, we would hire you, but we're not hiring. And they were on a hiring freeze because of COVID. So I kind of waited it out a little bit and then they didn't hire someone till way later. And so I was like, I, I'm, I'm ready to start working. <laughs> we, we love to hear that. That's so cool that you kind of like stuck to what you actually wanted to do. And yeah. it comes through in your personality. You seem like a very genuine, like straight to the point person. You're not going to like cut corners and do something that you don't want to do. Thank so you. Really cool. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. definitely. Um, so Joshua is asking, do you start central lines and how often do PAs do things like uh, central lines intubations? We had a few questions about that. Okay. So I have done central lines. Um, before I, I can do them, they can intubate. So intubations, I personally don't really do, um, because I'm on the other side of the sterile screen. If you would say, um, I'm in the, you know, on the sterile side, the anesthesiologist is doing the intubations, but if you work in the ICU, you can definitely do intubations. You can do all sorts of procedures like that too for trauma. Um, yeah, I can start central lines, do chest tubes, um, minor like lacerate, like laceration repairs, anything like that PAs can do. Awesome. So this is an interesting question from Alejandra. She's asking, what is the dynamic like with surgical residents and NPs? Do you guys get along? Does it kind of step on each other's toes or how is that relationship between you guys? Um, so I, the only surgical residents that I worked with was at the level one trauma center that I did. And basically the resident that I worked with was like a fourth or fifth year and he didn't care. He was like, I'll teach you whatever you want to know. You can do whatever you want. Um, he was great. I think it really depends on what year the residents are, because if you are at somewhere where you're fighting for basically procedures, then you're going to be competing. And 90% of the time, the residents win those battles um, where I work, we don't have residents, which is another awesome thing about, I mean, it's good and bad. It has its pros and cons for fighting for surgical time somewhere where you don't have residents is a little better because you're not fighting them for space, but then at the same time, you're not kind of in that learning environment all the time. So it really just depends. Um, during school, I only worked at one place that had residents. And like I said, the guy was well on his way to being a surgeon and he was like I'll show you whatever I don't care like you can do scrub into whatever you want um and I feel like most of the time you just kind of 
create, you just, you just talk to them and ask them. Um, and a lot of times you're kind of doing different stuff. Like a PA's role is different than a surgeon's role. So the, the surgical residents are trying to learn from the way that the surgeon is doing it, where a PA is trying to learn about where the PA is doing it or how they can assist the surgeon. Like it's just a different, you're, you're learning different things. Well said. Yeah. I, I think that you hit it on the head when it, you mentioned that it kind of depends on the person, right? It's like every resident is going to be the same based on how far they are in their education. I, I work at a teaching hospital, so I see like millions of residents and, you know, it just depends on who they are. Like some of them are really cool, like they're on their way or some of them are trying to impress that attending. So they're always like super hyperactive. They don't want to talk to anybody else but their doctor. So it really just depends on the person. So um, let's see. Um, what are your major roles during surgery? So when you're actually in the operator room, what are the, what are you doing most of the time? Um, so it really depends on the case. So we can like, we can cauterize, we can tie off vessels. We help with closing. Um, like a lot of times the surgeons leave and I close the case. Um, a lot of it is um, so like laparoscopic, laparoscopic cases, like I'm holding the camera, I'm doing some maneuvers with the, um, instruments. It really just depends on the surgeon and the case that you're doing. Um, like some, I know that like cardiovascular PAs, they harvest veins. So they literally do kind of their own little mini procedures at the same times. Like there's some ortho PAs that are working on, uh, patellar graft type stuff when the PA or when the surgeon is cutting bones, like it really just depends on the case, but there's a lot that you can do. And it depends on the surgeon you work with and how much they trust you and how much, uh, experience you have with them. Um, I work with, I don't know, five, six, seven different surgeons. And I do a little bit different stuff every with everyone. Some of them are very like not used to PAs and they're, they're like, don't know what to do with us. And then there's other ones that are like, here, go for it, whatever, you know, kind of thing. Like it really just depends. I do a lot though. Um, I, that was what I was worried about it a lot. Cause a lot of times you're just holding retractors, but that's not the case. Like I get to do a lot. I get a, um, yeah, there's a lot of procedures that I can help with. Awesome. Um, let's see. Um, do you have any, any advice for somebody applying with low GPA slash low PCE? Um, so the thing that I, I mean, I think your GPA is one of those things that depends how low it is. Like if it's in the threshold of they're going to look at you, then there's a lot of things you can do. But if you're on below the threshold of them, not even going to look at you, then you just have to get your GPA up and take more classes. Um, taking more classes will increase your GPA. So it just kind of depends where you are on that threshold. I always, always, always tell pre-PA students that the most important thing that they can do to improve their like basic uh, application is volunteer work. So finding something that you're passionate about doesn't have to be medicine related and basically just sticking with it, like showing them that you care about something that like is super important to you and that it actually really is you know, valuable to you that you're willing to spend your extra time when you're very busy trying to prepare for all of this. Um, yeah, volunteer work. That's like literally my number one thing. I'm like, you guys, the best thing to separate you is to show that you care about something bigger than yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, that's very well said. And that's kind of like the theme that we've seen from a lot of PAs when, when they're asked that question is that like, you can always turn kind of like a bad thing or I don't want to say bad, but like, you, you know, your lowest point on your application into a good thing by saying, well, like, yeah, my GPA is a little bit lower, but look how much time and effort I invested into something like volunteering. Right. Yeah. So everybody's a little bit different and it's always weird when you get caught up at comparing yourself to other people on like Reddit or whatever you hop on those forums and you see all these people with 4.0 mm -hmm. and 10,000 hours of PC and you're like, there's no way, you know, but that's why I'm so against those things, but, um, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, everyone's worried about it. It's hard not to compare yourself. Like you want to know where you stand, but I mean, even since when I applied to school and now it's changed so much, like they're starting to, uh, accept a lot younger people and a lot younger students with less like basically healthcare and patient care experience because there is such a need for PAs. Um, back when I applied, which like I said, wasn't that long ago, like I was the 
one of the youngest people in my class. And I think I started and I was 23, four. So like I was pretty young, but there's people now starting PA school at age 21. So there's a lot of variability. A lot of times you have to find the right school, like the school that kind of is molding towards like you as a person, like what you are wanting to achieve, like where you want to go, what your morals are and find a school that kind of fits that. And that's kind of, you know, a lot of it is just finding the place that works for you. Yeah, definitely. And it kind of mirrors the field in that there's so much diversity within it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but there was a good question from, uh, Maya and Mary. She said, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, do you think that it's possible to get married during PA school? And how did you handle your relationship while you were in school? Yeah. So, um, I think it depends on the program and how like your breaks are set up. So I had like a month and a half break between didactic and clinical year. Um, I would say planning a wedding during didactic year would be very tough. If your partner is actively involved, then, then yeah, you could like, you have the time to definitely do it. I mean, people had babies in the middle of PA school, so if they can do that, you can get married. Um, I got married at the very end of clinical year. So my husband was very involved in the process of planning. Like I basically told him like, this is what I need to get done. Can you know, like, and he was very like proactive, which made it a lot easier for me. Cause I was gone. Like I was in different States and you know, he, you have to go see vendors and all of that. So I think it's very doable. Um, it's just how much you want to put on your plate and how actively involved your partner is. Um, I would say in general, men don't like to be as involved in wedding planning as women do. <laughs> so just putting that out there. Um, my husband was very involved because I needed him to be. Um, and then what was the second part of the question? How did uh, you handle your relationship while you were in school? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that's a huge question. Um, usually I always like tell people to ask my husband how he handled it because I was, I was gone in Seattle. And I mean, we'd been dating for a long time. Um, and basically I told him, I was like, this is really important to me. Like I, this is probably the most important thing I'll do for myself. Um, I'm not going to be as involved in our relationship for the next two years. Like, obviously you want to be as upfront with them as you can. Our school actually did like a significant other, um, meeting and basically told them like your your significant other is going to be MIA for the next two years don't think that they don't love you it's just that they're really tired um, I actually yesterday on the way home a, uh, a girl called me who I who I've met who's in PA school and she was like I how, how how do I do this like I'm in finals like and I was just like you you know you basically get to this point that nobody's gonna understand what you feel like unless, except for the people that are in PA school with you. And so even though your partner is extremely supportive, if they are, there's no way for them to know what you feel like. So I found it extremely important to find people in my class that I bonded with and could confide in. Cause those are the only people that will understand how you feel. It's a, it's a really hard feeling to explain. Um, you're so tired and exhausted and but yet it's something you've dreamed of doing for so long that you're like in this mix of I'm tired and I hate myself, but I also love myself because I'm so proud of myself kind of a mix. Um, and just confide in when you can other people in your class and then be open and honest with your partner and just tell them like, I'm not going to be as, as involved. I'm going to need time. I'm going to be exhausted. I'm going to need you to just show up for me a couple of these times and then it gets better. Like there's an end point to it. And I think that was kind of what got us through is we knew that at the end of two years, like I was going to move home. Like I was going to be able to be more involved. I was going to be able to have, um, you know, time on the weekends. Like my husband would, or I guess he was my boyfriend at the time. We would see each other maybe, maybe once a month, maybe once every two months, even though we lived three hours apart, like it wasn't like we lived far, but I was so busy that I just needed to focus on school. 
And that worked for us. Some people are different. Some people were married. Some people had kids. Some people came home every night to their partner um, and they found a way to kind of shut themselves in a room and study. So it really just depends on like having that communication with them and open and honest, be like, this is what I need from you. Um, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be a crappy two years, but at the end of it, it's going to be better. <laughs> wow. That's it. I mean, that is great advice. Thanks so much for being so raw with us. That's like, you know, kind of that thing that you can't get from school. Like <laughs> yeah. this, this type of information is just like very, just like very open and honest with you. And just kind of like a side note, I, I got to brag on your husband. He sounds awesome. <laughs> I remember, he said that he cooks you breakfast before uh, work every day. I was like, man. He, he's he's, he's like, cooking dinner right now. He's oh my God. Like... Hopefully he can hear me because he seems like a great guy. You got like. <laughs> Don't let him hear you. I'll get to his head. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. So, uh, we'll cut that out of the video for tomorrow. <laughs> um, but are you okay with maybe one more question? Kind of sure. here. Okay. We always like to end on this. Um, just what are your opinions on the future of the profession? So where do you see PAs going? Um, if you want to talk about things like, you know, salary, um, saturation, or just the role in medicine, like whether, you know, there's all these conversations about like free practice states and being able to open up their own clinic. So what do you think it'll be like, you know, the next 10 years, what are we going to see? Oh, that's a big question. Um, so I feel like the PA role is new. Like, even though it's been around since the sixties, it's still a very new role. And a lot of what we do requires like being advocates for ourselves. And the nurses have a lot, they've been around forever. Doctors have been around forever. Everybody knows what a nurse and a doctor is. Not everyone knows what a PA is. The amount of times that I come in a room and people are like, who are you? You're wearing a white coat. You look like a doctor, but you say it says physician assistant. So you're an assistant. Like, what can you actually do? You know, like a lot of it is education to the patients. Um, a lot of even like healthcare workers and caregivers don't really know the roles and the extent of what you can do as a PA or a advanced practice provider. So like an NP. Um, so a lot of it is education and advocacy for our profession. And I think that's a, a lot of that's going on right now. Um, in Utah, they just actually like passed a law that the PAs can work independently without a supervising physician. So brand new PAs have to have, I think it's 10,000 hours of like some sort of supervision. So basically what I do now, like I don't really have supervision, but I do. It's, it's, right. I mean, like you, nobody follows me around and makes sure I do the stuff right. But there's someone out there that is assigned to like my attending physician that I could call if I needed something basically. Um, so in Utah, they just passed a law, I think a month and a half ago that says PAs don't need that anymore, just like NPs. And so when you graduate, if you have to work with supervision for 10,000 hours, and then after that, you're free to do whatever you want. You don't need any, like your license isn't attached to anyone. I think there's a couple other States that do that, but like, that's brand new. So I think in the next couple of years, like that's going to be a huge push, especially with COVID it's kind of like rapid fired, like gotten that into motion because there's so many places that need help and PAs have stepped in and they basically said, Oh, PAs don't need supervision during this pandemic. And then they're realizing, Oh, NPs don't have supervision in a lot of States. And it's not like we're trying to become doctors. It's just, we have a different role. Like our role is to be a bridge to create access to care and be able to provide care for patients that can't get to see doctors because they're they're like they're so full and they can't get in and you're not seeing them for months and months on end like our role is to bridge that gap so i think that especially with the pandemic is like awful and horrible as it's been it's kind of steamrolled us into action a little bit faster so it'll be interesting i think in the next couple of years that will definitely uh definitely change and be huge for the pa profession honestly yeah, it's, it's such an interesting thing. Um, so much good, but it, some, some, I mean, so much bad, but you know, some, some good came of it for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, well, thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, like I said, I'm sure you'll look back at the chat tomorrow, but yes. give you an idea, like so many thank yous. Uh, yes. You're amazing. Uh, very good advice. Incredibly informative, presented so well, just like the compliments never end. Everybody loved you. We had upwards of 200 viewers. So this is <laughs> 
Uh, you're <laughs> awesome. And thank you so much. You so um, much. I just, you know, for the viewers here, every I, I say this every time, but it just means so much. And it really speaks to the profession that there are PAs like, I mean, you're so busy. You have your life and your job. Like there's so much going on for you. And somehow you make time just to give back completely, you know, like at no benefit to yourself. Like, what do you get from this? You know, just because you want to help. So, I mean, it, it, that's always the big takeaway is like, thank you so much for being able to do this. I hope that the 200 of you guys that are watching here, like somewhere in the back of your brain, once you finish PA school, whatever it is, just remember that like somebody was out there just to help you. So Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you so much. It of means course. Lot. That's very sweet. Yeah, no, I'm happy to help. Like I said, you guys reach out to me for anything. Um, if you have any personal questions or anything, I really do love helping and being here for you guys because I know it's tough and I know that there's a lot of people that you want to understand, but they don't understand where you are and how stressed you are. So yes, thank you again for coming and listening to me blabber on. Um, I have to correct myself on my, on my GCS. Cause I felt like I was like blanking cause I was nervous, but it's eye opening verbal and motor. I had to say it. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm blanking. I'm nervous. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it was an amazing presentation. We really, really appreciate it sincerely. So, uh, <laughs> and that, that's just gold that, I mean, the opportunity that you're presenting all of these people here with just to have like that personal connection with you, whether they want to reach out to you on Instagram or whatever it is, we'll um, post your Instagram link in the chat. If that's okay with you, you might yeah. end up with a lot of followers and a bunch in a full inbox. tomorrow. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, whatever, email or Instagram, whatever works for you guys. I'm, I'm happy to respond wherever. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Can't thank you enough. Yes, of course. Thank you guys so much. Have a good good night. All See right. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night. All right, guys, fantastic presentation. Uh, it feels so good to be back. It's great to see you guys again. We watched the chat the whole time. So it's just so nice to see you guys kind of like interact with each other. Like I know a lot of the times that some of the questions don't get answered just because, you know, we have to be respectful of the presenter's time, but it's really cool to see that you guys are able to answer one another's questions and kind of break off into these side of conversations. Uh, just the community here is awesome. And, th and that's what we like to see, um, you know, kind of gives us an idea of of where this profession is is going for the future hopefully but yeah guys like i said we'll uh try and be a little bit more consistent uh we have a presentation pending right now for two weeks two weeks um but we'll try and at least do once every two weeks maybe once every week but uh just stay posted on instagram that's where we always uh tell you guys first uh ollie is working on setting up the quiz right now so that link will be set here in just a second um, she's going to talk to you a little bit about that just because we are going back to those automated certificates so that you get it instantly and don't have to wait on us. And we take like three weeks to finally send it to you. Sorry about that, by the way. Um, all of those, uh, certificates are sent now. Um, but yeah. Do you want to go ahead and talk about the quiz real quick? Yeah, let me just get this set up really quickly. Okay, so like I mentioned, it's the same format, um, five multiple choice questions. And as long as you answer at least four correctly, you'll receive the certificate. Um, since we are going back to the automatic certificates, uh, there is a limit initially, like for how many, there's a daily limit for how many it sends. So for today, the max is 100 and then it will reset tomorrow. And if there's more than 100, it'll send another 100, but it will automatically close as soon as it hits that limit but we will try to reopen it. It just takes some time before it lets us reopen it. So it, we might take like 10 to 15 minutes trying to reopen it, but rest assured we will get it reopened and you'll be able to take it. And then you should be emailed your certificate as long as you pass. And if not, um, give us at least like one to two weeks to make sure all the certificates are sent out. And then of course, if we don't receive it, feel free to message us on Instagram or send us an email. Yes. So brief summary, links being posted right now. Please take the quiz. It might say that it's full. Give us like 10 minutes to reopen it. I don't know why, but it takes forever to get the certificate thing reopened. Um, if there is like some crazy issue where it's not letting us reopen it, we will just do it manually. So we'll send out a second link and that way we can send them all, uh, all out. So don't worry. Um, you will get it. It might just take a second for you to be able to submit it. And we usually hang out in the chat for a little while. So if there's any weird issues going on, just feel free to reach out and ask us questions. We'll try and respond immediately. Um, but yeah, guys, here is the quiz. She just posted it in the chat there. Go ahead and jump on there. 
Um, like I said, if there's any questions or anything, please reach out to us. We're hanging out in the chat. You can uh, message us on Instagram or however. And it is open for one hour, so it'll close at 1030 Central. Okay. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Y'all are awesome. It's so good to be back. And uh, we'll see you maybe in a week, okay? All right. You guys take care. Bye. We're hanging out in the chat if you have questions. Take care. Thank you again. Bye.